Kamen Rider Revice is a show that's been really hard for me to make my mind up about. It comes so close to being just an absolutely amazing show, but falls short in so many places that it's honestly just frustrating. I think all of its individual parts really highlight the reasons I got into tokusatsu and Kamen Rider in the first place. It has really strong themes and story ideas, some of the most lovable characters I've ever found myself attached to. It's a series that has great subtext for an older viewer, but always keeps a larger context that wouldn't alienate a younger one. And it probably has the best last episode in all of Kamen Rider. But at the same time, everything feels mixed up and out of place. Some of its best plot points occur at times in the story that that make no sense. Amazing side characters that are abandoned and forgotten about and then brought back only to be completely underwhelming. And they made such a great ending episode that comes five episodes too late. The story of Kamen Rider Revice is easy to summarize, but hard to really capture. It's a family that owns a bathhouse and battles their inner demons, inner self, and insecurities. Kamen Rider is a franchise that most often uses a found family. And in the early production of Kamen Rider Revice, that was almost true here as well. The first idea was to have three different people from three different walks of life all working together at a theme park on an artificial island. And in the early pitch meetings, there was a big push to make the main character a female. Of course, that idea didn't last too long. The writers were reminded and it was reinforced that Kamen Rider is a show for boys that some girls might like. Planning for Kamen Rider Revice took place in the throes of the pandemic, a fact that was essential for some of the pillars that were pushed in the show. Parents were home with their kids and they wanted children to view their family from a different perspective. Families can fight, they can walk different paths, they can be infuriating, and some have secrets that can hurt you, but at the end of the day, these are things that can be worth fighting for. Bringing things like the family Eden Sukiyaki together, a symbol of their connection, or the fact that the family business is a bathhouse. Bringing attention to the fear that establishments like theirs were struggling to make ends meet during the pandemic, and in danger of closing. The show follows the Garashi family, consisting of the children, Iki, the oldest, Daiji, the middle child, and Sakura, the youngest, as well as their parents, Yukami and Genta, mostly focusing on the three Igarashi siblings. I honestly like all of these characters if you boil them down. Iki, our main character, is a former soccer player who gave up on his dreams to take care of a family business. He's hot-headed and quick to jump into things without fully thinking of the consequences. Daiji is in a military organization called Phoenix, but is shy and reserved and makes up for it by being overly loyal and prideful. He looks up to Iki, but feels overshadowed, and develops an inferiority complex that the show boils down to being an allegorical sibling rivalry. Sakura, being the youngest, is a classic overachiever. She tries to be the best or undefeatable at everything she does, creating a fear of being weak. The parents, Yukami and Genta together, I absolutely fell in love with. Genta is a dad with a YouTube channel that's trying to get rich quick, and the mom is the classic matriarch of the family holding them together. Proud of Iki's work ethic, proud of Daiji's discipline and career, and while extremely overprotective of her youngest daughter, proud of Sakura's determination. I can't fully put into words how much I appreciated seeing this couple. Just seeing these two happy and totally in love with each other. Genta lifting up his wife, her reactions to his silliness, showing utter dedication to their marriage and family was honestly refreshing to see in a tokusatsu drama, especially when there's a cliche of the mother or father or both being dead in these types of shows. Parents have a ton of ups and downs and character arcs. I love them when they're there, but about halfway through the series, the show seems like it just doesn't know what to do with them anymore. In the original plot of the show, Yukami was planned to be killed off in the first episode. She's still attacked and hospitalized and it plays into her character, but for the most part the show just acts like that didn't happen. Thinking was that this would change the overarching direction of the narrative, switching it over to being a revenge narrative and not so much a family one. Even if the remnants are still visually apparent in this show, I really appreciate the change and think it was the right decision for a better story. All of the siblings are well-rounded characters with strengths and weaknesses. It takes them on rewarding character arcs. Their interactions as siblings feels genuine, if not maybe a tad bit cartoony, but hey, come on, it's still a common Rider show.
it kind of comes with the territory. All three develop demonic personifications of their weaknesses, and I think that really works for this story. I like everything about the idea of the demons in this show and how they're used. It's not unique to turn people's like inner desires into the catalyst for turning them into a monster, but it's not something you typically see with heroes, pointing out their character flaws over top of just their ideals or values. The main gimmick of the season is stamps. As an American viewer with a very light understanding of how like Hanko stamps work in Japan, I found this a really Really cool idea. If you're unaware, hanko stamps are a very big part of societal life in Japan. The most simplified version is instead of a signature, use a hanko stamp for documents. Inside the fiction of Revice, the stamps are used to make a pact with demons. I personally love the tale of Faust, and the idea of the Mestophelian bargain and Faustism, and seeing that as a basis for how some of the interactions work inside of this show, for both the hero and monster designs, kind of scratched a pleasure zone inside my brain. And yet, yeah, your mileage may vary. I've heard a lot of people dislike the idea of the stamps and the demons, and of course taste is always subjective, but for me, it really worked. At least conceptually. Each of the siblings have their own demon, but they are very, very different from one another, and very personal to each character. The most obvious one is Icky with Vice, I mean, he's the guy on the poster. And half the name Revice. Vice is like, what if Icky's hot-headed nature went unchecked? Personified into a demon that was designed with mixing Marvel's Venom, a genie, Deadpool into a character that's kind of played like a larger-than-life Disney villain. Daiji's demon, however, goes into the opposite direction as Vice. Daiji's biggest inner turmoil is his feelings of inadequacy, the part of you that's jealous and feels unworthy, part of you that envies to the point of hatred. So this demon is personified as himself, or the person he would be if he didn't have a consciousness telling him to behave and hold back. And then there's Sakura, who I really like the idea of. Sakura is a character who's pushing herself in all directions both studious and athletic, kind and committed. She wants to be unbeatable in any medium. She wants to be undefeatable when she needs to defend the weak. So her demon personification is weakness. It creates Lovkov, a plush chibi snake demon that mostly just gets in the way. She is fierce and powerful, but her weakness is always internal. But now with Lovkov, it's on the battlefield. Her weakness that she always strived to hide is now out and vulnerable, and easily susceptible to getting hurt and being attacked. It's also worth pointing out that I mostly binge watched Kamen Rider Revice over a long weekend, with my partner who would wander in and out and watch a little bit here and there. And anytime they would catch Lovkov being beaten up or hurting themselves running away from a battle, they absolutely hated this character. It wasn't really important to my experience of the character, but I did want to throw that out there. Honestly, I love these demons and I love how they take different forms and they mean different things and they don't really relate to each other and how they lend themselves to making a more complex character. If you boil them down, they're really easy to understand. But if you apply them to the characters that they're born from and how they interact with each other, it just makes for really interesting characters. The journey of Icky and Vice is honestly great. You're free to disagree, but I loved watching the character arc of these two together. I heard a lot of people complaining about how Vice is annoying and yeah, he's the type of character I typically shy away from. But honestly, and maybe it's because he's a demon, I think he works. I liked his fourth wall breaking, and for me that just felt like a weird demon living inside of somebody's head projecting outwards. Just thinking of those moments like an inner monologue that escaped the inner part. In the beginning of the show, Vice attacks Icky's mom and always wants to eat people. Icky is reasonably untrusting of Vice. Their relationship builds not just with Icky, but with the entire cast. He goes from wanting to eat people to wanting to be a part of the family meal, partially because his base instincts are to eat, but narratively, it's because that's where the family connects. That's where it reinforces their togetherness through better or worse. Watching the mom outwardly show disdain for Vice and then later tells him that he's part of the family just felt really right. There's not some instant moment where everything changes, it's a subtle relationship growth over the entirety of the show. And by the time it gets there, it feels really earned. Outside of the Igarashi family, there's a whole slew of supporting characters. I won't go into each and every one of them because this would just be an eight hour video, but the two organizations I wanna talk about are Phoenix and Deadmans. They're interlinked in a lot of ways and they show opposing views to our main themes. Putting it simply, Deadmans worships a vagina god and turns people into monsters and Phoenix says, don't do that. Daiji and eventually Icky are both part of Phoenix. 
I found this a really cool organization full of interesting characters. It's where you find both Hiromi and George. Hiromi is probably the show's biggest misstep for me. He's a good character and the original plan was for him to be killed off in the first episode. But due to the actor's enthusiasm in the audition, it made them rewrite the character so he would be a bigger part of the show. I like him. A lot until I don't. He plays the good soldier who will die for his ideals, always shouting that he'll lay down his life for anything that's worth defending. Eventually something happens to him and it's a giant turning point to the show. It sows doubts into Daiji and it rocks everybody's foundation of the world. It changes the battle lines, it paints the whole world in gray. It's the moment that the show aligns with the themes of the demons. There's no good and evil, simply a dialogue between the two. Two sides of the same coin. He stands for so much and represents the show's themes so prominently. He disappears, and then, in a clip show of all things, he's just unceremoniously brought back. And from there, he's just around. He does do things, but it ultimately doesn't do anything for his character. These are all things that could have been given to somebody else. And it just feels like it undermines everything that he stood for in the first half of the show. I love that they wanted to give him a bigger role, but ultimately they just had no idea what to do with this character. And then there's George. He's a character that I'm ultimately conflicted on, but in the short term, he's my goddamn boy. I don't know if it's intentional, but George reminds me of Hunter S. Thompson. He's obsessed with Kamen Riders, and it never clearly states whether the old Kamen Riders are in this universe or not, but it is heavily implied. George also makes the stamps for turning into Kamen Riders, and is obsessed with the Kamen Riders, and he's honestly just a super fun character. However, him making and delivering stamps in the show is is a total letdown for me. I'm fine with him creating and making the stamps and other devices. And in theory, I love how that wraps into his larger character arc throughout the series. But anytime he gives like a new power up to somebody, it just feels so cheap. It's like he just makes these things and then throws them to people with like no rhyme or reason. It's fine. It's just a lot of the times it just doesn't feel earned by the show. He's just like, yeah, well, here's a here's a power up. Have fun. I guess. This doesn't sink the show or anything like that, I just, I found it distracting. He's also the spot where Kamen Rider Revice is the 50th anniversary of Kamen Rider comes into place. Him being a fan of past riders, and I'm still mad this clip from the intro never really showed up with him like having Kamen Riders contained in an experiment. He gives Revice a ton of Kamen Rider themed upgrades, but it was a conscious choice to make these be visual references to past Kamen Riders, and not so much like a giant celebration like in Kamen Rider Decade or Kamen Rider Geo, making the choice not to focus on the Kamen Rider but focus heavily on the drama of the show. And yeah, more to come on the suits in a little bit. George spends most of the series being morally ambiguous. You discover why, and really as long as you don't think about it too much, it makes sense. I like all of the parts of his story arc, but they all happen in really inconsistent bursts. He's a character that gets a lot of screen time and a lot of the plot develops around him. He's estranged from his father who comes back, serves as a really great narrative contrast to the Igarashi family. But by the time that idea finally pays off, it's just far too late into the season. It's a weird metaphor for grief, it's very reactionary, and I guess it makes enough sense. At least enough that I'm not like mad about it. But just like Hiromi, it's just such an unsatisfying use of a character. There's never a time I don't like seeing this guy around. I absolutely love the character and I love how he's acted. I love his little phrases of English. I just, I wish he was used more appropriately and consistently. Then there's Deadmans, who I like a lot as a villain organization. They kind of represent more of a found family. It features three people, just like our three siblings, who all worship GIF or GIF food, depends on what sub you're using, who I'm going to ask, was it intentional to make GIF look like female genitalia? Because come on, this video is going to be demonetized. I really like these three as villains, but I was really worried in the beginning because they kept showing up, getting into fights and then getting their butts kicked. And it would just repeat that cycle. 
It felt like a bebop and rocksteady from the Ninja Turtles situation. I won't go into it, but eventually all of the characters and their moral alignments kind of change and grow and switch places. And for the most part, it works really well. Aguilera is the obvious standout. She has this evil princess thing going on. She eventually gets her family and her identity kind of ripped away and rearranged. After which she burns her dress, which was a symbol of her family and like a wedding. And from that point on, she wears all black as if she's in mourning for the family that she lost. I don't want to fully go into it, but I think she's a really special character and one of my favorite growths from any character in a Kamen Rider series. Oteka is, well, he's a jerk. That's it. That's his character. He really stands out for me as an example of the show kind of having moments that don't always land even though they get built up in a way that feels like they should. He takes the place of the central antagonist for a little while and eventually disappears. Again, only for him to re-arrive and the show to do absolutely nothing with him. Julio is a character that I think is really well done, but again, is just this valley of missed opportunity. He morally flexes all over the place. He also does a good job to highlight how there could be redemptions or how different characters can can view the world differently when it comes to ideas of justice. He's a character that the show projects whatever it needs to onto him. He always wants to be a bigger part of the plots happening around him. But by the time the show gives him a significant moment, it just doesn't land. And I also have to point out that this man has the world's most unfortunate haircut. Then there's Gif as the main villain. I've mostly heard people dismiss Gif, but I actually love this thing as a villain. Love how you spend most of the show not knowing what the hell it is. And the fact that it looks like that, it's ominous and it made me spend most of the series guessing what it is. In the end, all my guesses were exactly right because it didn't try to pull a fast one on you. It is what it said it was going to be. It's evil incarnate. It's a bad guy. I think Gif only has like five lines through the entire series. He's a symbol of evil. And that's all he really is, but that's also what I liked about him. He's a symbol, a symbol that multiple people gather around throughout the show. He's evil and powerful, but he's used as a story tool for other people to react to. He doesn't make for an interesting villain, but he makes for a really interesting story device. Who's the enemy is always changing in Revice, but Gif is always somehow at the center of it. He represents this idea of fear and subservience. The idea that giving up freedom might lead to peace, and understanding that puts the morality of the world in a gray area. There's never a time where Gif isn't thought about as the bad guy, but just because he's fearsome doesn't mean that everybody's answer is to find a way to destroy him. For a lot of characters, Bowing down to GIF is the right move. GIF is just something for other characters to react to, and that's something that in Revice I really liked about its storytelling. The pool between good and evil is not black and white. The original Kamen Rider from the 1970s was a war tool, developed by Shocker, an organization that was birthed by former Nazis. He escapes from being brainwashed, and that puts Kamen Rider in kind of a gray area. I think Revice really uses this same idea and paints its characters into a rich tapestry of conflicting ideas and values. Again, working the idea of inner demons, not as monsters that you need to destroy, but parts of you that you need to learn to coexist with so that you can grow and become stronger. That dialogue between good and evil being two sides of the same coin. Icky isn't a common writer who goes around and says, I am the hero for justice. He goes around and talks about being a hero from the freedom of fear, while Daiji walks a different path and talks about peace. Freedom and peace are not radical ideas and they don't have to conflict. But when you look at the gray areas between good and bad, there can be differences. Daiji's entire character between him and his demon and his transformation is the literal dialogue between good and evil. His driver has two sides for Kamen Rider Evil and Kamen Rider Live, two sides of the same word. I know it's stilted and it can feel disconnected at times, but all of this good and evil pushback really worked for me. I have such conflicting opinions when it comes to the suit designs in Revice. I love the base forms of Revy, Vice, Evil, Live, Jean, and apparently I'm alone thinking that Aguilera's B butt face is cool. I think Aguilera's is really neat. Let's go. Fine. What? You tripping, bro. You tripping. No. Get your horn. <laughs> You tripping. Started off not liking Vice's form upgrades, but I grew to really like the like motorcycle style helmet over top of his demon head. Because at the end of the day, for the suit actor, the demon head is a helmet. 
with another helmet on it, so it's double helmets. However, the suits I didn't like, I like really didn't like. And I'm sorry in advance, I feel like everybody loves it, but I did not like the design of Kamen Rider Demons. I can't stand this. It's the asymmetrical spider web for me. I could be fine with this, but like, Demons is such a huge part of the show. And in so many of the stories and so many people transform into him. And I don't dislike over demons as much, but honestly, it's just because I find it incredibly boring. And then there's the demon army guys, and I'm sorry, it just, they don't do it for me. But Kamen Rider Jean is one of my favorite suits in all of Kamen Rider. The colors, the sleekness, and the like loop thing on the visor, I'm just so into it. There's a thing I struggle with in tokusatsu that I find really distracting, and that's the dissonance between characters in and out of the suit. We know that everybody is played by suit actors and not the actors that are in the drama. But Revice does one of my favorite things to help fix fight scenes, and that's untransformed fights. Revice does a great job of making the characters in the show feel like the characters who are in the suits. There are so many great, quick, untransformed fights. You never feel like these three siblings are not ready to fight. Every one of them you believe is ready to jump into these battles. It's a really easy thing to mess up and feel like the drama actors you could just never imagine them throwing a punch or a rider kick. And I just wanted to acknowledge that I liked how Revice treated this. So I talked about the individual story elements that I really like, but what about the drama as a whole? Revice has this weird thing happening through basically its entire runtime. It has so many moments that the show really wants to be gut punches. And it does a great job of building up emotional scenes, but somehow fumbles almost every hard hitting moment for me. Let me be clear, they're not bad. They're just always timed poorly. Revice manages to be a really binge worthy show. The story never stops moving and Revice does a really good job of making you just want to click on the next episode. However, it's always weaving in some other story or mystery and shows us some other character that by the time it gets back to the character moment that you were on the line for, you kind of forgot that moment was ready to be paid off. I can't count how many times I would watch something and I'd know what I want to feel in that scene, but it just, didn't make the connection for me. After GIF is defeated, the show goes on for a handful of more episodes. And these are the most painful episodes in the entire series. The plot isn't bad, it's just inappropriately placed. As an early plot point or a mid-series addition, I think this would have been a great adventure. But how they placed it at the very end, it just felt abysmal. It drug on for far too long and ultimately did not make sense for the rest of the characters. Yet. Somehow after that, Kamen Rider Revice had one of the best last episodes in all of Kamen Rider. I won't go into the hows and why, but the last episode is exactly one thing. Kamen Rider Revy and Kamen Rider Revice fighting each other. Even if you didn't like most of Kamen Rider Revice, even if most of the emotional moments didn't pay off the way they should have, even if you have to watch the last five episodes to get to this point, this was a tokusatsu drama ending the right way. It's watching two friends show off everything they've learned in the last 49 episodes. There is no other conflict. There are no other enemies. There's not a cataclysmic event or a threat to the greater good. It's a much more intimate fight. It's an appreciation of life and rolling around in the grass with your best friend like you're seven years old. Holding on to those solemn moments before you have to say goodbye to a friend who's about to move away. Knowing it might be years before you get to see them again, if ever. It's my favorite ending of any tokusatsu show I've ever watched, and it ends in a way that's just so Kamen Rider Revice. I'm Hi-C, and I hope you keep watching.